Hey guys, welcome to another anatomy video and today we're going to actually be going over some landmarks found in the skull. In the last video we went over the names of the bones of the head, but today we're actually going to dive in and learn more detail about some of the bones and their landmarks. Now, I have a couple of friends who are actually anatomy tutors and they mentioned to me that I should inform you how the skull is actually divided. Now the skull, the bones of the skull are divided in two parts and I'm going to show you this chart right here which should illustrate that. Right here we have a chart with some new vocabulary that we haven't been introduced to before. The first one being neurocranium. Neurocranium is the set of bones that surrounds the brain. And in this box over here, I have shown all the bones that fall into the category of neurocranium. You can think of the neurocranium as the brain case. And there are eight bones that make up the neurocranium. The other bones of the skull fall into the visceral cranium or the facial bones. The facial bones consist of 14 bones and they're shown in this box right over here. And these 14 bones make up the facial bones. Okay, so visceral cranium means facial bones. These two groups of bones, the neurocranium and the visceral cranium, make up the bones of the skull. Now the auditory ossicles and the hyoid bone are part of the bones of the head. In fact, all four of these groups are part of the bones of the head. The neurocranium, the visceral cranium, the auditory ossicles, and the hyoid bone are all part of the bones of the head. However, if I ever mention the bones of the skull, or this is a bone of the skull, I'm not referring to the auditory ossicles or the hyoid bone. And again, if they mention bones of the head, it's all four of these groups, but if we're talking about bones of the skull, we have to exclude the auditory ossicles and the hyoid bone. Now, if we go over to the next slide and look at this image right here, that shows the difference between the two. So obviously you could see the neurocranium and the eight bones that make it up. And then down below, you can see the visceral cranium and how they make up the facial bones. So right here is a perfect image of the neurocranium versus the visceral cranium. Okay. So to start off, we're going to go ahead and learn all the landmarks found in the frontal bone. Now, when it comes to the frontal bone, we're actually not going to learn too many landmarks. We're only going to learn three. The first one being found in the bony orbit. And it's found right here. This ridge line right here on the superior portion of the bony orbit. This right here is called the supraorbital margin. of the frontal bone. Remember to print it back to the bone. Just above the superior orbital margin, you can see this kind of elevated area right here. You can see that kind of darkened shadow they have right here. This elevated part, just superior to the supraorbital margin, is called the supraciliary arch. Again, paired it to the frontal bone. So the names are pretty self-explanatory. So the supraciliary arch, the arch right here, uh, indicated in blue, and the supraorbital margin is indicated in red. Now there's one more landmark that we need to know, so let's go ahead and move to the next image. Here we have removed the parietal bones from the skull cap, and we're looking down on the posterior aspect of the frontal bone. There is a small hole located right here. It has one or two names. The first name you can call it is the blind foramen of the frontal bone or you can call it foramen cecum of the frontal bone. And those are all three bony landmarks found on the frontal bone. Now before I go ahead and move on to the next bone, I want you to see this region right here. This right here is not at all part of the frontal bone. This is actually the ethmoid bone. And it is part of the neurocranium, so we'll actually get to this bone later in this video. But don't be confused, this right here is not the frontal bone. This is the ethmoid bone. The frontal bone goes down up here and around 
and it continues going down those the way transversely. Okay. All right. Now we can go ahead and move on to the temporal bone. The temporal bone is a unique bone, and it has lots of important things found within it. Um, this is where we're able to hear, and this is where our balanced sensory receptors are as well. The temporal bone is actually divided into three different parts. The first one being called the squamous part of the temporal bone. Some people call it squamous or squamous, it doesn't matter. The second part is called the petrous part of the temporal bone, and it's actually the densest part of the human body. And the reason for that is because it's protecting where we hear and where we can balance. So the, it's very important that it's the densest part, So because we don't want it, that part to be damaged. So this is the petrous part. Again, paired it back to the temporal bone. And it's actually much larger than what I've indicated here in this image. I'll show you the rest of the petrous part. It's deeper within the skull. And the third and last part of the temporal bone is called the tympanic part of the temporal bone. And it's this little hole or region right here. And that's called tympanic part of the temporal bone. Awesome. Let me go ahead and show you the rest of the petrous part of the temporal bone. And right here is the continuation of the petrous part that I was mentioning earlier. Now, if any of you guys speak a Latin-based language, um, especially Spanish, you can think of petrous like piedra, which means rock. And that should help you remind you um, that this is the densest part of the bone. So again, this is the petrous part. Of the temporal bone. This is the squamous or squamous part. And the last one is this little opening right here, which is the tympanic part. Now that we know all the parts of the temporal bone, we can go ahead and learn the landmarks starting with the petrous part of the temporal bone. So right here is the internal view of the temporal bone. And again, we're looking at the petrous part. Um, the other image we're looking at was an external view, and now we're doing it from an internal aspect. This hole right here found kind of on the underneath side of this thick projection right here holds a special artery, and it's called the internal carotid artery. So because of that, this is called the carotid canal of the temporal bone. The second hole you see right here, and this is found on the posterior aspect of this ridge line, and that's how I always identify it. I find this, I find this ridge, and just posterior this ridge, you can see this hole. This hole is called the internal acoustic meatus of the temporal bone. And when we get into nerves, um, this hole will become into more play later. Um, there's a certain nerve that goes into it. But for now, just know that this hole is called the internal acoustic meatus. And again, it's found just posterior and a little bit inferior to that ridge line. Now, if we continue forward in the image, this is an inferior view of the temporal bone. And it allows us to see more landmarks found on the petrous part of the temporal bone. You could see this spike right here, and some of the other images, such as this one right here, you could see that spike coming out right there. This spike is called the styloid process of the temporal bone. And we've seen styloid processes before in the superior limb, so this landmark should be really easy to learn because it is shaped like a styloid. Going back to that other image, Again, we can see the styloid process. Of the temporal bone. This hole right here is actually the external part of the carotid canal. So this is the just the carotid canal. Of the temporal bone right here is a mound. And this mound is actually something you can palpate on your own skull. This bump right here just 
posterior to your ear is called the mastoid process of the temporal bone. Between the styloid process and the mastoid process of the temporal bone, there's a small hole right here. That small hole is called the stylomastoid foramen. Awesome, and those are all the landmarks found on the petrous part of the temporal bone. However, now we gotta go back and do the landmarks found on the squamous part of the temporal bone. So again, we're back in this image, and we're looking at the landmarks now found on the squamous part of the temporal bone. Right here you have this long projection that's sticking out, and it's very evident and easy to see. This is called the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. And it's called that because this process, this sticky outy thingy, is actually reaching and articulates to the zygomatic bone. And that's why it's called the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. Now, the next landmark is found back on this image. Again, we can see the zygomatic process sticking out right here. But there's an additional landmark that's just inferior and posterior to it. We have this depression right here. And this depression is called the mandibular fossa of the temporal bone. Now you can guess why this is named the way it is, is because part of the mandible actually fits right into this depression, and that's why it's called the mandibular fossa. And those are all the parts that we need to know for the squamous part of the temporal bone. And now we can go ahead and go over the last landmark, which is found on the tympanic part of the temporal bone. We return again to the first image of the temporal bone, and right where the tympanic part of the temporal bone is, it's covering a hole. This hole right here, this opening, is called the external acoustic meatus of the temporal bone. Remember, we already have an internal acoustic meatus, which is found on the petrous part of the temporal bone, over by that ridge line, remember? This one right here. So this is the internal acoustic meatus, and this one is the external acoustic meatus of the temporal bone. And again, we'll go into more detail in what roles they play when we go into the internal ear and the middle ear, as well as the nerves that go around in the brain. Okay, but yeah, these are all the landmarks found in the temporal bone. Remember, the temporal bone is separated by three different parts, the squamous, the tympanic, and the petrous part, and they have all of their individual landmarks. Now we can go ahead and move on to the next bone. The next bone being the occipital bone. The occipital bone is fairly flat, but there is a curvature to it on the inferior portion of it, and it doesn't have too many landmarks, but there are a few that we need to learn. The first one being a bump that you can palpate on your own head. It's found on the most posterior part of the occipital bone, and it is called the external protuberance. of the occipital bone. And that's really the only landmark that we need to know that's kind of on the external surface. But if we work our way down inferiorly, a lot more landmarks come into view. The first thing that catches the eye is this big hole right here. That is called the foramen magnum. Just anterior to the foramen magnum, we have these two roundish projections right here. These are called condyles of the occipital bone. Now just posterior to those condyles, we have two little holes. One here and one here. These are called the condyloid canals. 
of the occipital bone. Again, the condyloid canals are just posterior to the condyles of the occipital bone. Now, if we move in and look in more of an internal aspect of the occipital bone, we can see an additional landmark found here and partially right here. Again, these are two more holes, and these are called hypoglossal canals. of the occipital bone. You can partially see the condyloid canals right here. And those are actually all the landmarks that we have to learn for the occipital bone. So it's quite simple. Just the external protuberance of the occipital bone, the condyloid canals, the hypoglossal canals, and then the condyles of the occipital bone. Oh, and we can't forget this giant hole right here which is the foramen magnum. Now this bone is the sphenoid bone and it's a very odd looking bone. It's actually one of my favorite bones because of its shape because it kind of looks like a bat or a butterfly or some sort of flying creature, especially in this image right here. You can kind of see it almost looks like there's legs at the bottom of it and large wings. Well, thinking of it as a flying creature is actually going to be quite helpful because it actually does have wings as part of the landmark of, of this bone. If we look at this top portion of the sphenoid bone, we see this region right here. This region that I'm outlining is the lesser wing wings, pardon me, lesser wings of the sphenoid bone. Just below it are a much greater set of wings that come up all the way up there and all the way back here. These larger wings are called the greater wings of the sphenoid bone. So that's actually quite easy to remember because they do look wing-like. Now what look like feet of this flying creature are called pterygoid processes. So right here is one pterygoid process and here's the second pterygoid process. Each one has two separate, um, you can say plates, because that's what they are. These are plates, and they're called the medial plate of the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. And then these over here are lateral plates of the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. Now an alternative name you can use instead of plate is lamina. In lamina, all that means is plate, and it's, that's just Latin for plate. So you can either say medial plate of the pterygoid process, or you can say medial lamina of the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. And the same applies to the lateral plate of the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. Now if we go ahead and return back to the first image of the sphenoid bone, we have this weird looking groove. It comes up and then down and it comes up again and it almost looks like a seat. Well, that's what the anatomist thought at least. And they said it kind of looks like a saddle, more specifically a Turkish saddle because of the style and the way this projection comes up. It's very similar to how the, t um, the Turks have their saddles made. Because of that, it is called the Sella Tursica. of the sphenoid bone. Just slightly superior and lateral to the cella tersica are these two holes right here. These are called optic canals of the sphenoid bone. Directly lateral and slightly inferior to the cella tersica, we have this roundish hole right here and it's the same on the other side. Since it's a round hole, it's called the round foramen of the sphenoid bone. Just posterior to that hole, you have these two holes right here. These are oval shaped, so they're called the oval foramen.
And the last foramen that we're going to learn is this tiny one right here, and there's one on the opposite side as well. These holes are called foramen spinosum. And that concludes all the landmarks on this sphenoid bone. So this is the ethmoid bone, and it's actually quite straightforward. Looking at this image, we have an anterior view of the ethmoid bone, and we can obviously see this large projection. This is called the crista galli of the ethmoid bone. Down here, we have a large plate that's going inferior from the rest of the bone. This is called the perpendicular plate. of the ethmoid bone. This image again shows the crista galli as well as the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. However, there's an other region that we need to cover and it's this flattened portion right here, this square I'm making. This square is called the cribriform plate. Now the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone, as you can see in this image, has a ton of tiny little holes. Those holes are called the cribriform foramina. Foramina, all that means is multiple holes. So foramen is one hole, foramina is many holes, okay? So this is the cribriform foramina, so it's lots of holes found in the cribriform plate. That's why it's called the cribriform foramina. And those are all the landmarks found on the ethmoid bone. In fact, those are all the landmarks that we need to learn for the neurocranium. Now you might be asking, Eric, we didn't you know, cover the parietal bone. What's up with that? Well, the parietal bone, actually, we don't need to learn any landmarks on the parietal bone. It's very flat. It's, um, there's not many unique features found on it. And so it's just good enough to know that the parietal bone is just the parietal bone. There are landmarks on it. Um, if you have an atlas, you can learn them on your own. But for this video's purpose, um, we don't learn any of those landmarks. We, ha we rather focus on bones that have more unique landmarks. And that's it. That's all of the landmarks found on the neurocranium. I hope this video was helpful and it's going to help you guys study and so that you do well in your exams and your quizzes. See you guys next time. Bye-bye.